It is always a stirring pot of emotions whenever I get up here or any place that I get to present a portion, a part of God's Word that I've been an opportunity to study. I'm always afraid to say the wrong thing. I'm always afraid to speak in such a way that would not be authorized or accepted by God. But I will always get up here or anywhere that I've been asked or given the opportunity to preach, and I will stand on the foundation that Larry stood on this morning of truth. I will always teach truth. I will always preach truth. And I firmly believe that if I were to be the last man standing in the church of God, that it doesn't matter how many people would reject God's word, that it would still be the standard of life. That as we find in John chapter 17, verse 17, would be the words of life. That his words, being Christ's, would be truth. Nothing short of that. I work for an extremely large company. Most of you know what I do by now. I sell cars. Some of you don't like car salesmen, and I get that. But my point this evening for making that statement is I want to dive in and give a, a brief, I'll give you the baby of what my company is like, which you'll find is not so different from the one that you work for, or maybe the business that you own. It contains what we call structure. Within that structure, within the framing of this company, there are certain steps that we take to ensure that our customers leave with a smile on their face, knowing that they've just had the best experience possible in purchasing a car, which unfortunately normally doesn't happen from, from what I keep hearing over the last year. Um, but we're trying to change that. And within my company, as any other, there are two types of people. And I'm not talking about the blue collared and the white collared. I'm not talking about the corporate versus the lower ladder in the chain of command. I'm talking about two attitudes that we find in any kind of person that we cross faces with at the store, at school, maybe at work. The two attitudes that lie therein would be those who win and those who don't. Those who have a mind to work when they wake up every day and they put their uniform on and they clock in at work, or wherever they're at, they have a mind to win. They don't have a backup plan because their only plan is plan A, to succeed. And then we find the latter, which would be those who maybe don't care enough to create a plan, maybe don't set an alarm in the mornings and they sleep in because they've got nothing to get out of bed for, maybe those who suck on the unemployment, whatever it may be, so on and so forth. But there's two minds in any corporate job that don't differ from the, that of a Christian. As a Christian, we have a mind to work. We only have a plan A. We don't have a plan B. We have structure and we have the paths as we were just told about in uh, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, to seek the old paths. There is no other path that we are instructed to take. God has laid the foundation for the Christian. God has laid down the structure. He has built a tower for us to live in. He has given us a path to follow. There is no fork in the road unless we create one. Those who win follow God, and those who don't will fail. This evening, I've got three main points that I want to cover with you and the conversation that we're going to be having is going to be that of familiarity. It's not going to be too far-fetched, but it's going to be a healthy reminder of what it means to be a Christian. And the title of my lesson is going to be The Ramifications of Neglecting God's Instruction, for those of you taking notes. My three main points are going to be how that affects us in three different ways. My first point is going to be spiritually. My second point is going to be physically. And my last point will be emotionally. 
how we are affected, what our ramifications, what our consequences as Christians are when we stop listening to God. What happens as a Christian? Let's find out. My first point this evening, spiritually, we are affected and we suffer consequences when we neglect God's word. The first step in this is that, first of all, it doesn't happen overnight. Just like anything in life, it has to start somewhere and it takes time to happen. It doesn't just come into our minds one night and we just forget God when we wake up. But our first fault is that we stop studying. Maybe we think that we know enough or maybe we don't have enough time to sit down for 15 minutes a day to go over what God has given us. Maybe we don't care enough to make it a priority. And a result of that is that we forget God's word. We start to erase in the back of our minds the scriptures that we've known from a child, the stories that we've read about. Maybe because of it being muscle memory, we can recall a few things here and there, but can you have a legitimate conversation with, so, with a soul who is not a member of the Lord's church for more than five minutes without stumbling, without not knowing what to say? That's where we fall to as the church as a whole. Portland. How many conversations have you had this past week in the last seven days since we last assembled last Sunday with a face that you saw at the store, with somebody you saw at work, with a soul that you know will not make it to heaven? Do you know enough? The first step is we forget God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Just like King Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles chapter 29 in the Old Testament. Do we know about him? Do we remember him? We're not going to turn over there now because I've got some more passages I want to look at. But King Hezekiah found the word of God when it was brought to him. And he brought it out of the temple and gave it back to the people. It was locked up. And he said, this, this shouldn't be. This isn't right. God's people ought to know his instruction don't you think it's odd how he didn't just say, follow whatever your heart says you ought to follow? Do what you want to do? He didn't do that because he knew that in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, that they would be destroyed if they didn't know who God was. The next step is that we grow weak spiritually. When we forget God's word, naturally, we're not going to be as strong. We don't know our material when we don't know the criteria that needs to be met in order to not only just become a Christian, but to remain faithful, to grow therein. As we're going to talk about here in just a brief moment, how Paul describes that you are of the milk and not of the meat. I have to take you back to the principles, the elementary things concerning the gospel. He actually uses the word unskilled. You are not skilled in the word of righteousness. We're going to talk about that here momentarily, but that is what happens when we forget God's word. We grow weak. Are you weak? When is the last time you examined yourself? Are you weak in the faith? In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, this is where Paul talks about this. But now, if you go to chapter 12, verse 1 in Hebrews, we find what comes along with that. When he tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, or it's assumed to be, Paul, excuse, excuse me, we don't know who the author of Hebrews is, but in that chapter, in verse 1, it says to lay by every weight, lay aside every weight that, that does so easily beset us. It's so easy to get caught up in this world. It's so easy to say, I'll study tomorrow. It's so easy to go to work for 12 hours a day and work so hard that you can't come home and function at the end of the day. But it's simple, and it takes discipline. It takes discipline to open your Bible and to say, I know that this is the only way to get to heaven, and it's so easy and simple, but I need 15 minutes a day. I need 30 minutes a day with God. I need this two-minute prayer with God. I need to be meditating on these things on my lunch break at work. I need to be happy. I need to have a smile on my face when I'm around people in the world so that they know I'm different, so that they know I have something to wake up for. I need that. And so do you. 
Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 is where we get caught up in a lot of stuff as Christians. You could put this in every category possible. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 says, No man can serve two masters. You're going to hate the one and love the other. Now who that is is up to you. And your daily actions will define that answer. There's no such thing as fate. And I'm going to say that in such a way that it's not predetermined. There is no predestination for you. You make your own fate. What you do every day when you wake up, your morning routine, the way that you live your daily life, how you go to bed at night, what time, what you eat, every little thing in your life will determine the next event that happens. You drink a lot of coffee, guess where you're going to be sitting in the next 15 minutes? It's going to be in the restroom, most likely. But every little thing that we do affects and defines the next course in our life. The next step is that we cause others to weaken. And this here is one of the scariest, scariest things to me as a Christian. Because it's easy for us to just forget about other people. It's just me. It's just my life. It's my life. Let me live it. Don't worry about me. Why do you care so much? Stay out of my business. You're being nosy. Stop gossiping about me. Stop telling others to pray for me. Let me do what I want to do. What we don't realize is that sometimes those people are the only people that we have left in the world that care enough about us to come back to us and say, hey, I I care about you and you're doing wrong. I'm praying for you because I know that you're not living right. I can see that you're struggling, and I want you to know that I noticed that. I want you to know that you're in my thoughts and prayers. Maybe we get a card in the mail. Maybe we get a text or a phone call, an uplifting word. How often do we do that for others? There is a thing called benevolence. There is a thing called edification. They are works of the church. Do we practice those things? Even worse, when we start to weaken ourselves, bless you, when we start to weaken ourselves, what happens? We become a cancer to the church. If Mr. Morgan back here begins to gossip about me, Do you think I'm going to take that in such a way that is going to be, hey, thank you so much. I appreciate the thoughts. I appreciate the concerns. No, I'm going to take that and it's going to hurt my feelings. Not because I'm sensitive, but because now he's spreading a cancer in the church. I'm just using you as an example. Don't worry about it. But that becomes a cancer. Now we affect somebody else. So when we say it's just my life, don't worry about it. When we do things in secret, our secret sin will come out eventually in the way that we talk, in the way that we act, in the way that we see the world, in the way that we go about living our daily lives, we will impact somebody negatively. We will push them away from God. We may be the only light that they ever see. We may be the only influence towards the gospel that they may ever come across. And you just weren't in the mood to bring up the Bible. You just weren't in the mood to tell them about how you became a Christian. Maybe you were too afraid because you haven't put the discipline in and the time to study your Bible, to know how to tell them about the plan of salvation, to know how to tell them that Jesus Christ died for their sins. The next step is that we forget God completely. This is under the spiritual aspect, mind you. So we've covered, we, we forget God's word, we grow weak, and we cause others to weaken, and we forget him completely. He's no longer a part of our daily living. And that starts with Revelation 3.15, where God says, I would rather you be hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I spew you out of my mouth. How many people do you know in your life that can't make up their, their, can't make up their mind or make a decision about what kind of person they want to be? One day they're happy, one day they're, they're so, so positive, and the next day they come into work and they are just a drag to the rest of the staff. They are just a drag to your attitude. They have a negative impact on you. Maybe they have a positive impact. They can't decide which one they want to be. Or maybe the worker, what kind of worker they are. Inconsistency. God hates inconsistency. We're going to go through our ups and downs. We're going to go through our highs and lows. But what you do in your lows will determine if you can get back to your high. What you do in your high will determine if you ever get back to your low. And that starts with this. The Word of God. 
This is the only structure that he has given to us. Jeremiah 6.16. This is the old path. Sodom and Gomorrah. What a perfect example of a result of neglecting God's word. My second point this evening, physically, the ramifications of neglecting God's word and how it affects us physically. We begin to sin. Sin is born of our desires and the action that we take upon those desires. What comes after that? A guilty conscience. Why? Because God did instill in us morals. What do we do with that? We fix it. Do we? Or do we just have a guilty conscience and we try to hide it? We try to cover it up? Because most of the time that's what happens. When we don't have a heart to repent, we try to hide our sin. Turn with me to 2 Kings. I'm sorry, 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Most of us are familiar with this, but I want to I want to go over this briefly as a reminder. 2 Samuel chapter 11, starting in verse 2. And then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. David wasn't doing anything wrong. He was in his palace. Maybe the mistake that he had made in the previous context was that he didn't go to war with his men. Maybe he should have gone to war. Maybe he should have fought with his countrymen and stood beside them. Just a sidebar real quick, how many times do we just let our fellow Christians go out into the world and fight for the gospel? The saying has been true all of my life because I've seen it time and time and time and time again. 10% of the church does 90% of the work. Are you a King David? Let's get back to the main subject here. King David wasn't necessarily doing anything wrong at the moment, but he stumbled across something that gave opportunity for sin. There's something within a man that gives him a desire to be with a woman and vice versa. There is no denying that. God made that in us. But there are limits to that desire when it comes to God and what he's asked of us. And David just completely neglected those, those parameters. Look with me in, uh, in verse 4. Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and, she lay with, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. Look with me in verse 5. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David and said, I am with child. I can only imagine what was going through David's mind at this point. He's probably thinking, you've got to be kidding me, right? I don't need this right now. I don't need this in my life. But let's see what he does about it. Drop down to verse 15. And he wrote a letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him, that he may be struck down and die. Uriah was the husband of this woman that he had just impregnated, that he had taken selfishly. And look with me in verse 17. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Ten more verses. Go to verse 27. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David did had displeased the Lord. This escalated very quickly. We're told that David was a man of God. He was a man after God's own heart. Yet look at the evil that he did. And it all started with neglecting the parameters of God's word. The example that he set for his servants in the palace, for the men of war, for the citizens of his kingdom, was none other than a perfect example of, I don't care what God has to say, I will do what I want to do. And this is what it leads to. Murder, lies, guilty conscience, trying to cover it up. It's no different for us. And what happens after we get to that step? We try to justify our sin when we're caught. Look at Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3 as we covered in our recent gospel meeting. We did a very in-depth topic on church in the modern world and we brought Genesis chapter 3 up in brief discussion. But we find in Genesis chapter 3 the fall of man. And what did they do? That woman that you made for me, she goofed up. She made me goof up. 
Do we do that? Yeah, we do. Why are you talking about this person? Well, they did this and this to me. They shouldn't have done that. I wouldn't be talking about them if they hadn't done that. If they hadn't given me a reason to talk about them. What kind of mindset is that? How do we differ from the world when it comes to that mindset? We're supposed to be different, brought out, a royal priesthood. We're supposed to be called out of the world, not remain in it, not to blend in, not to wear the personality and the, the traits and the characteristics of the evil that walks next to us, beside us, in front of us, and behind us every single day. Yet we do sometimes. Yet we do most of the time. Yet we do every once in a while. Aaron, in Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. <laughs> Look, man, I, the, the people, people needed something. They threw all their, their gold earrings and rings into the fire, and a piece of steak came out, man. This cow just walked out of the fire. I can just see Moses' look on his face. I can just imagine him going... That's your story? I just, I just want to confirm one more time before you stick with that. that. That's your decision? That's your final answer? And I can only imagine what God was seeing. I can only imagine what God had felt. God, God wanted to destroy them. Moses actually came down from the temple, and they weren't quiet about it. In fact, it was such a loud, disruptive noise that he thought they were fighting. When he came down on the mountain, I can just imagine Moses saying, what is going on down there? And he finds out that they're worshiping a golden cat that they had just formed themselves, as if it had some kind of spiritual, eternal being, substance, whatever you want to call it. Can you imagine how that started? All because they didn't look to God first. They weren't patient for God. They didn't stay in the parameters of what God had asked them to stay in. And then soon we begin to love our sin. Soon we begin to love it. Exodus, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 18 is uh, where Sodom and Gomorrah is found, the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. You look in Exodus, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 18 and verse, uh, verses 20 through 33, it gives you a very vivid context of Abraham's conversation with God. And he says, let me find 50 men. 50 righteous men, and you'll spare the city. Yes. 40, yes. 30, yes. He gets all the way down to five. Five men. If I can find five, five righteous men, you'll spare the city. Yes. But we know what happens. God destroyed them anyways. How do you think that started? It was a lack of care for God's word. A lack of care for his instruction. And that is what leads us back to Jeremiah. They didn't seek the old paths. They didn't care to know what God had to say about how they should live their lives. I saw this on Facebook the other day, and I shared it, and it was, it was a wonderful post. I don't agree with most of the things found on Facebook, because most of it is a bunch of junk and a waste of time, but I found this, and it stuck with me. And it was about somebody else saying that the Christian walk should not be that of what makes you feel good. It should be that of what makes you disciplined. And there's nothing truer than that statement. That's why we're told to put on the whole armor of God. When you're a warrior, you can't be doing just whatever you want. There are certain str strategies. There are certain elements. There are certain pieces of armor that you must wear when you go into battle in order to succeed. There are things that you must do. There are fulfillments you must make in order to win in this life as a Christian. You cannot work your way to heaven, but you can't just believe all the way there either. You have to have a mixture of both. You have to follow God's paths, because if you truly believe it, as we talked about, it's an active faith. It is an obedient trust in God that drives us to live a certain way. And lastly, emotionally, it affects us when we neglect God's word because... For starters, we begin to question God and the truth. We all know that the smarter that we get, the more knowledge we obtain, the more we understand. Unfortunately, that's not always true when it comes to mankind in general. Most of the time when we gain knowledge, whether it's secularly or spiritually, 
we get a little puffed up because we think, well, this person doesn't know as much. I know how to sell a car better than this person. I know how to cut this piece of wood better than this person. I know how to do their job better than they can and mine on top of that. I know more about this topic than this person. Knowledge, knowledge puffs up. There's actually a verse for that. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. Its end is destruction. There's something within us as humans, as mankind, man and woman, that leads us to do whatever we want to do, whatever we feel is right. But that's not always right. We have a moral system, we have a moral code, but when we compromise that because we have a, a brain up here that we can reason things out and we convince ourselves and we can lie to ourselves, we're, you know we're easily deceived. I know I've, I've mentioned that before, we all know that. <laughs> but it doesn't take anybody to, to deceive us. We do it ourselves. I can eat that Twinkie, that's not gonna be a problem. I have a high metabolism, dad, I'm never gonna get fat. And then I got this job and I gained 30 pounds because I thought I knew more than my dad. I can just eat whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. I can wear whatever clothes I want. I can, I can walk out half naked on the beach and still be a Christian. No, you can't. I can talk however I want to. I can slip a cuss word here, here and there. No, you can't. I can have whatever kind of attitude I want to have towards anybody because I'm American. No, you can't. First Amendment, I have the right of free speech. Sure you do. Are you using it for the benefit of God? To bring somebody to the gospel? We question the truth because we think we know too much. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23, we're told that it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Why? Because of that. Look at the world that we live in right now. Look at the country that we live in right now. What happened? We used to be a godly country. And now we're fighting communism and socialism. I don't care what color spectrum you stand on, whether you're red or blue. You cannot deny that we're getting farther and farther and farther away from God. You can't deny that. And eventually there will be a time where they will target us as the church. And it will purify this church here in Portland. It will split it. It will do whatever it's going to do. But that result is going to be up to us. Each and every individual that's sitting here tonight, I don't care if you're eight years old and you're growing and you're, you're not listening right now because you're younger or because you're 80 years old and you think that you know everything and you're strong enough to fight the wiles of the devil without studying every day, without studying every week. Your reputation will just get you there. No, it won't. Are you going to be strong enough when the government comes after you to say, stop preaching that? When we have Caiaphas is telling us to our face, you're not allowed to talk about this anymore. When they beat us and they whip us, whip us with stripes. What are you going to do? Are you going to say, we ought to obey God rather than man, as Peter did? Or will you do the same thing that Peter did earlier and say, I don't know that man. He's not mine. He doesn't belong to me. Emotionally, we question things. We think that we're, we're better than we are. We think that we know enough to get by. But then when we're called out on it, maybe when we're asked to, to be a part of worship, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. And then we start to get questioned, hey, hey, how come you don't want to do this? I just, I just don't. I just don't want to do it. That's just not my thing. I'm too scared to do it. Or, hey, I've noticed that you're slipping away. You're not here every Sunday. You're not here every Wednesday night. I don't ever hear from you. I've tried to reach out to you several times. It angers us. So we question the truth, and then it angers us to a point where we don't want to listen anymore. There is a way that seems right, but in its end is death. When we start to wander from God, it angers us when God keeps popping back up in our lives. God gives opportunity for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 tells us that for every opportunity of sin, there is an avenue of escape. And often we neglect that avenue. Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 23, there are some people that become so angry that we find that they become just like this king here in Jeremiah that burned the scroll. Or maybe the other king that tore up the scroll that had the word of God on it because it angered him so much he thought, I'll just get rid of it. I'll burn it. I'll never have to look at it again. And why is this? Because, because John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21 tells us that the darkness hates the light. 
You cannot be in the gray area. You cannot be partially dark and partially light because light will purify whatever room it's in and it will scatter the darkness like cockroaches. It will vanish like that. Darkness is a lack of light. When we choose not to have an abundance of light in our life, that creates a lack of light, which then consumes us with darkness. And that sounds super deep, and it is. It should be. We should take it very seriously. Galatians chapter 4, verse 16. We find the famous question, Have I made you my enemy because I tell you the truth? Unfortunately, that guilty conscience that you may be talking to, the person that you may have in mind, may not even be yourself, maybe somebody else, but look at yourself for a moment. And put yourself in the shoes of being asked that question when you're wrong, when you have that guilty conscience. And somebody comes to you and says, I love you enough to tell you that I don't think that this is right based on the Word of God. Imagine that person looking you in your face and saying, do you hate me because I'm trying to help you? Maybe your closest loved one, or maybe, maybe the person that you hate the most. <laughs> maybe the person that you dislike the most in here or at work. Do you hate that person? No matter how you feel about them, because they have the right paths. Maybe spiritually somebody here tonight hasn't sought the old paths. Does it anger you? Are you lost? Are you confused? Because you're in Matthew 6, 24, where you're trying to serve two masters. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 tells us that not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, will get into the kingdom of heaven. I'm talking about Christ. And there's two paths that we ought to look after. One is the straight and narrow, and the other one is the, the broad and the, the popular path to follow. The easy path. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, we're told about those false teachers who will heap up itching ears for themselves so that they don't have to hear the truth, so they don't have to be angered by it anymore. They can have soothing words that will give them what they want to hear. Is that you this evening? And lastly, the truth no longer becomes anything that bothers us. We're angered by it after we question it, but then we give up and it doesn't bother us anymore. 2 Peter, as we come to a close, chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. 2 Peter, chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter, is, the latter end is worse than them that were in the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Pair that with Jeremiah 6.16. Have you sought the old paths these last few days, these last few weeks, these last few months, the last year, two, four, five? Do you have a guilty conscience this evening? Because I'm going to tell you right now, we could be like those people who questioned in Second Peter as well, not in this chapter, I forget where it is, but they said, where is God? For since our fathers slept, the world has turned as it always has. Have you taken today for granted because it's Sunday and it's routine for you to be here? Have you taken it for granted thinking that after I get out of here tonight, I'll go eat at Chili's, I'll go lay my head down? drink some water before I go to bed, wake up tomorrow for work, get dressed, have another week before I come back for routine worship, because I'm going to tell you, you may not have that opportunity. But right now, God has given you an opportunity to fix your guilty conscience, to fix the consequences that you are going through right now of neglecting his word. John 17, 17, as we mentioned earlier, his truth are his words, and his words are his truth. And the truth that he speaks to you tonight is that of, you are not promised tomorrow, but there will be a day when you will have to answer for the things that you have done in this body. So this evening, if you have any need, and you need to, you need to fix something in your life, please come forward while we stand and while we sing.